This morning in 1 Kings chapter number 19, we're looking at a guy named Elijah. This guy is a great prophet, a mighty prophet. He had seen God do more in just a few days than many of us have seen God do in our entire lives. And he's coming off of a major win, a major victory where he saw, saw God call down fire from heaven and burned up all of these altars on top of Mount Carmel and all of these prophets of Baal who were there to kind of try to prove that they were better than God, they were all shown that God was greater. And so he's coming off of this amazing victory, this awesome thing where he saw God move. But we see a little different side of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19 that we're going to look at today. Starting at verse number 2, if you have your Bible with you, uh, you can read along. It says starting at verse number 2, so Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. She's referencing all of her dead prophets, all of the ones who are dead there. She says in verse number three, it goes on to say, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Here's my question. What is Elijah afraid of? What is, he, what is he afraid of? He's just had this major victory, this powerful man of God, this great prophet who has seen miracles, signs, wonders, this great leader, this guy who has just literally seen God send down fire from heaven and completely destroy all of these false prophets is afraid. And in my mind, it's like, what, what is he afraid of? You would think that he would be more bold in this moment than ever before. You would think that he'd be more excited in this moment than ever before, that he would expect God to do some amazing things. But the reality is that I try to constantly remember in my life and, and constantly keep in the forefront of my mind is it is possible to have great faith in one moment and great fear in the next. It's possible to have these moments of audacious faith and then to have moments where we're conflicted and afraid. But it goes on and continues to say in verse 3, When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. And he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. It's a little bit dramatic, but I'm a little dramatic myself, so I kind of like the dramatic there. He said, I have had enough, Lord. And I wonder if you've ever felt like that before. I wonder if you've ever felt like that or maybe feel like that today. Like, God, I've had enough. God, this is too much. I've been through too much. I cannot handle any more. I've had enough. Said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. Elijah, this mighty prophet, this great prophet who's seen God do all of these things, is afraid and on the run. And it's not because he hasn't seen God work. It's not even because of anything that's actually happened to him. It's all because of what somebody said was going to happen to him. It's not even, he hasn't even experienced anything. He just had Jezebel who said he was going to die. And to be real, I think that Elijah's just tired. I think he's tired. I think that he's, he's tired of running. I think he's tired of fighting. I think he's tired of constantly having to be the one who's there for everybody else, the one that everybody else is calling on. I think he's tired. And, and maybe you've been in that place before. Maybe you're there today where it's like, God, I'm just tired. I'm tired. I, I, I feel like I can't go anymore. I feel like I can't do this anymore. It's always something. I'm overwhelmed because in those seasons and in those moments, it can feel like everything is happening simultaneously. Like the problems are happening all at once at the same exact time. And that's how Elijah felt here. And he did not know if he could go on. He did not know if he could continue to move forward in the life that God had called him to. Even after seeing God do amazing things in our life, sometimes we still get tired. We still get worried. We still get afraid. We still get discouraged. We still want to quit. And that's what we see in Elijah's life in 1 Kings 19 is that he's in a season where he wants to quit, where it'd be easier to stop and to give up and to go and do something else. And he's wanting to quit, but he had come too far to stop. He had come too far to give up and to quit because dawn was coming. But if he would have stopped, then he never would have seen it. 
And the same is true in your life, wherever you're at today, whatever you're going through, dawn is coming. And I believe God has brought each and every one of us too far to stop now. So I want to talk to you this morning on the subject, don't stop now. Don't stop now. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for today and we just thank you that we have the opportunity to come before you this morning and to, to worship you and, and to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that in these next couple of moments that we share together, that you would help each and every person to see and to hear from you, not to see and to hear from me. Lord, I pray that you would prepare our hearts, help us to have ears to hear and to apply what you speak. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase before, but have you ever heard the phrase selective hearing? Selective hearing, selective hearing is what mine and Nicole's dogs have. Okay, they have selective hearing. That's where a, a person or a pet or something, they can hear you talk. They can hear what you're saying, but they select what they're going to listen to. They just choose what they're going to listen to, even though they can hear everything you're saying. And at our house, we, we don't have any fencing in the front, just on the sides and on the back because it's our neighbor's fencing around us. And we have no fence in the front, but it's never been a problem until a few weeks ago. I would let the dogs out. They'd go take care of business, come back. I'd let them out. They'd go take care of business, come back. But a few weeks ago, I let them out, and they didn't come back for like 20 minutes. So I went out, and I'm calling for them, calling for them, and they finally came back. Then the next night, same thing. I let them out. They don't come back. So I'm calling for them, calling for them. They finally come back. So the third night, I was like, okay, I want to see where they're going. I want to see what's going on. So I let them out. About a minute later, I go outside, and I start calling for them, start trying to look for them. And I, and I walk around to the backyard where they normally like to go. There's some horses over there for our, from our neighbor's house. And they like to go over there. They're not over there. So I start walking towards the front of the house, towards the street. And I'm calling for him, calling for him. And as I get closer to the road, I see uh, Lakota, our boxer. She comes running around from the front. She went across the street, but she was right on the edge, comes running back to me. And I continue to call for Rigsby. He's a French bulldog, right? He's got a bulldog mentality. He's stubborn. He is Nicole's dog. I like to let everybody know that, that that is not my dog. Rigsby is Nicole's dog. And so I'm calling for him, calling for him, nothing. And I get to the edge of the street, and I look across in this cow pasture, and I see in the midst of all these massive cows, I see this little tan dog eating a cow pie. And I'm like, oh my, I'm like, Rigsby, come on. And he ignores me. And I'm like, Rigsby, come on now. Right, like I got my bold, tenacious speech out. Like he, the, the speech when, you ain't even heard that before, but I got a speech that just instills fear, not really. But I, I say this, and finally, I watch as he just kind of struts over to the edge of their fence, army crawls under it, and then comes back across the street. And what made me so mad in this moment was that I knew he could hear me. I knew he was listening, but he was choosing not to listen. He chose not to listen. Did you know that it is possible in your life to hear people say things and to choose not to listen? Did you know that it is possible in your life to hear the enemy saying things to you and to choose not to listen? Because the enemy knows that he cannot stop what God is starting in your life. He knows that he cannot stop what God is doing in your life. So he will try to come in and to tempt you with certain things to get you to stop yourself. And there's three temptations I want to look at today that he comes at us with. And the first one is the temptation to listen. He gives us the temptation to listen. It said, starting at verse number two, that Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. See, Jezebel's always talking. Jezebel's always got something to say. And here she's telling Elijah, you're going to be just like them. And the same way that they're dead, you're going to be dead. The same way that they died, you're going to die. You're just like them. And this is the same broken record that our enemy is constantly playing in our lives. You're just like them. You're just like them. The same way that their marriage failed, your marriage is going to fail. The same way that their dream died, your dream is going to die. The same way that they didn't figure it out, you're not going to figure it out. The same way that their career died, your career is going to die constantly just talking and saying all these things. And, and many of us have stopped pursuing the purpose that God has given us 
because we're listening to words that really have no weight. And unfortunately here, Elijah listened to what Jezebel said and he believed her. He listened and he believed her and it caused him to want to run because Jezebel spoke, Elijah listened, and then he ran. She spoke, he listened, and then he ran. All because of what she said. See, when we start listening and focusing on what everybody else says, it causes us to lose sight of what God said. And it's creating an identity crisis among followers of Jesus, where we hear one thing about ourselves in his word, but then we hear something else from someone else or from the enemy, and we start to try to figure out, who am I? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to leave? What am I supposed to believe? What am I supposed to handle this situation? Because we're hearing all these different things and we're choosing not to just listen to what God said. We struggle to, to hear all these different areas and all these different things and, and it's creating this identity crisis where we don't know, God, who am I? God, who am I supposed to be? God, what am I supposed to do? Because the enemy said that you're gonna lose. But God said, you're more than a conqueror. The enemy said that, that you're not going to make it, that you can't do this thing. But God said, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. The enemy said that you're unlovable. But God said, while you were yet a sinner, Christ loved you enough to come and die for you. Everything that the enemy's saying is full of lies. But God has a truth for every lie of the enemy. But only you can choose what you listen to. Only you can choose the voice that you listen to. And Elijah, he, he felt, he, he was called, he was anointed, he was appointed to this thing. But because he listened to the words of Jezebel, he began to feel unqualified and disappointed. And, and, and sure, like, was there a threat? Yes. Yes, there was a threat. But that's all that it ever was, was an empty threat. Jezebel said, you are going to die. Just like my prophets are dead, Elijah, you are going to die. She said, by this time tomorrow, Elijah will be dead. She made a threat, and it was, it was a legitimate threat, but that's all that it ever was because Jezebel did not dictate Elijah's future. God dictated Elijah's future. Jezebel had no holding on Elijah's future and what God was going to do for him. God held that in his hand, but Elijah... He, he listened to what Jezebel said. She said, may the gods deal with me ever severely if by this time tomorrow, you're not like one of them. You're going to die just like they died. You're going to be dead just like they were dead. And she said all these things that had no weight, no bearing, because Jezebel did not dictate his future. God did. God was the only one who controlled Elijah's future. God and Elijah because of what Elijah chose to listen to, it started to, to turn his future and what God was going to do. But she said, by this time tomorrow, Elijah will be dead. And 24 hours passed and Elijah did not die. 48 hours passed and Elijah did not die. 72 hours passed and Elijah did not die. 96 hours passed and Elijah did not die. One week passed, one month passed, one year passed and Elijah did not die. One decade passed, Elijah didn't die. A century passed, Elijah did not die. 1,000 years passed and Elijah did not die. To this day, it's been over 2,800 years and Elijah has yet to die. Why? Because when heaven starts something, no matter what they say, hell cannot stop it. When heaven puts something in motion, no matter what hell says, they cannot stop it. But we have to choose to listen to God's word above what everybody else says. We have to choose what we listen to. And, and then the next thing that the enemy will come at you with is the temptation to run. If he can get you to listen, he can get you to run. If he can get you to listen to all the lies, he can get you to go on the run. And that's the next thing that we see here is that Elijah in verse 3 is said that Elijah ran for his life. He ran for his life. This mighty prophet is on the run afraid of what Jezebel was going to do to him, afraid of what Jezebel was going to be able to handle 
in his life, and he's on the run. And to be honest with you, I don't blame him. Because just because you win a victory in a battle, it does not remove fear from the next. Just because you are triumphant in this battle, it does not mean you don't have moments of fear in the next. And I don't blame Elijah here, because the reality is I've never had somebody look at me and tell me that they were going to kill me and mean it. I've had people tell me they wanted to kill me in a joking way. I've never had somebody look at me in my eyes and say, I'm going to kill you, and I knew that they meant it. Now, maybe you've experienced that before. Hopefully not, but maybe you have. But I never have. So I know that in my own life, I know my first instinct reaction would not be to say, oh, praise the Lord. Isn't God good? It's amazing. Right? Praise dance. My first reaction would not be to throw a party. My first reaction would not be to stay in that place. Matter of fact, I'd be like, hey, look at that. And they turn around and I'd be gone. I'd be on the run. I'm not just hanging out there. I'm going to be on the run. Because our first instinct in our lives as humans, when things get difficult, when things get confusing, when answers seem to disappear, our first instinct is to run. Whenever we don't have the answer, our first instinct is to run. And, and so Elijah, he ran in this moment because running was what was easiest. Running is easy. It's less, like, I'm just going to be real and be honest, right? Running is easy to just be able to just run from problems and run from conflict and run from confusion and frustration and uncertainty. Just to run from those things, that's the easiest thing. But just because it's easy does not mean that it's best. Just because it's easy does not mean that's what God has for you. Because God had brought Elijah to this place for a purpose. He had called Elijah for this purpose. In this moment, Elijah is there because God wants him there. But the words of Jezebel caused Elijah to quit prematurely on the call that God had placed him. He quit prematurely on the calling that God had for his life in this place. All because of what Jezebel said. He just stopped. And I wonder how many of us have prayed, God, use me. God, work through me. God, God, whatever it is that you want to do, do it in my life. And we prayed these great audacious prayers of faith. But the moment that it got hard, that it got difficult, that it was confusing, we ran. God, use me in a great way. But the moment that we see a, a question that we don't have the answer to, that we see something that we're like, I'm not ready for this. I'm not prepared for this. I don't know how to handle this. The moment that we saw that, we go on the run. But hear me, church, God is not a God on the run. God is not a God who changes his mind. And if he planted you somewhere, that's because he wants you to be planted there. If God planted you somewhere, he will sustain you and protect you there. If God brought you somewhere to try to say that God wants me to leave now is not what God is saying. If he planted you in a place, it's because that's where God wanted you to be planted. Well, I know, but I thought that God wanted me to be here. I thought that God planted me here, but things have gotten a little difficult. I have some questions that I need answers to. I have some things that I don't understand. So maybe God really wants me to leave this place and go somewhere else. No! If God planted you there, it's not because he wants you to run from there. It's because he planted you there for a purpose. And if he planted you there, he wants you to be planted there. He wants you to be there. Don't run and don't quit. Because the third temptation that the enemy will try to use is the temptation to quit. He'll try to get you to quit. Elijah gave up in verse number four. He said, he came to a broom bush sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Elijah, this awesome prophet, this great guy, he, he has this moment here where he prays and he literally says, God, kill me. God, I want to die. He prays this prayer that he wants to die. All because Jezebel has said that she's going to kill him. Does anybody else see the irony in that? 
that, that he's praying, God, Jezebel wants to kill me, so you kill me. Makes no sense. Makes absolutely no sense. God, I'm going to die at Jezebel's hand, so instead, can you just kill me? Either way, Elijah's going to die. Might as well go out triumphantly, right? Might as well go out instead of begging God to take your life. Might as well go out with just a, a fight against Jezebel. Go out in a raging battle, whatever it may be. Doesn't make any sense. But oftentimes, the decisions that we make out of fear are irrational. They don't make sense. The decisions that we make out of fear don't understand the truth of what God said, so we make a decision that doesn't even make sense, but it makes sense to us in the moment. But in the grand scheme of things, it's crazy. And perhaps one of the most irrational things that fear will cause us to do is to be so afraid of being defeated that we choose to defeat ourselves by quitting. So afraid of, of trying and failing that we choose to just not even try. The enemy knows he cannot stop what God wants to do in your life. He cannot stop what God has called you to. So he will try to tempt you to quit on your own. He will try to get you to give up on your own, to think, you know what? I don't have what it takes. I don't have the answers. I'm not made for this. I can't handle this. So that you will quit on your own. But I promise you that the pain of quitting is always worse than the pain of being hurt in the process. The pain of quitting is always worse than being hurt in the process. Than saying, you know what, I'm going to try this thing. I'm going to push through this thing. I'm going to do the best that I can. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through this thing. It's so easy to blame everyone else for the reason that we didn't succeed. When the truth is, many times we don't succeed because we chose to quit. So easy to blame everybody else and point fingers at everybody else that it's their fault, that it's their fault. When the truth is, we chose to quit. We chose to give up. We chose to stop short of what God was wanting to do in our lives. We got tired. We got afraid. We had questions. We got uncertain. So we gave up and we quit. And we never gave God a chance to actually work a miracle. We never got, gave God a chance to actually show up. We quit believing. We quit trusting that God would do what he said he would do. We quit trusting that God would heal our marriage. We quit trusting that God could save our children. We quit trusting that God could help our career. We, kept, we quit trusting that God could help us and, and heal our body. We quit trusting that God would bring somebody to our lives. And we quit. And the hard truth this morning and the reality is that that we don't want to face is the truth that we've all been there before. We have all had a time where we wanted to quit. We've all had a time where we wanted to give up. But all that matters is that we choose to continue. And that's the last thing I want you to see this morning. And we'll have the worship team back out to close us in worship. No matter what all these things, what matters is that we choose to continue. Because Elijah's sitting here and, and he's listening to the wrong voices and he's on the run and he's trying to quit. He's saying, God, take my life now. Do all these things. But it says in verse number five that he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. And all at once an angel touched him and there by his head was some bread. And he said, get up and eat. And he looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals in a jar of water and he ate and drank and then lay down again Elijah was lying there wanting to die he's lying there waiting to die and an angel appears and tells him to get up eat and drink and Elijah chose in that moment he chose in that situation, in that circumstance, he chose to eat and to drink. And then it says that he lied back down. Look at that. It says he got up, ate and drank, and then lay down again. He faced the temptation to listen. He faced the temptation to run. He faced the temptation to quit. 
but he chose to continue. Hear me, church. We all are going to have bad days. We're all going to have days where we want to quit. We're all going to have days where it would be easier to run. But none of those things matter. We beat ourselves up over this, over the feeling of doubt and the questions and the uncertainty and God, I don't understand this and God, I'm struggling with this. We beat ourselves up over this, but none of those things matter as long as you choose to continue. At the end of the day, Elijah listened to the wrong voice. He ran, he wanted to quit, but he chose to continue. If God has brought you this far, don't stop now. It may be scary, it may not be easy, but if God was with you to begin with, the same God that was with you when you started will be with you and see you through the end. Don't stop now. Don't quit now. Don't give up now. Don't lose your faith now. Don't stop trusting God now. Don't stop believing God now. Because if he started it, he's going to finish it. All that matters in the grand scheme of everything that you're going through, everything that you face, everything that you experience, is that you don't stop, that you choose to continue. Get knocked down, choose to get back up. Confused, choose to find the answer. Frustrated, choose to find freedom in that frustration. Depressed, choose to find the joy. Get up, choose to continue. You've come too far. The fact that you're here today, you've come too far to stop now. You've come too far to give up now. 